So first of all, I want to welcome everybody to the August edition of the Serenity Nonprofit Connection. Um, although this topic really isn't just geared for nonprofit organizations. Um, so we've got hopefully some nonprofit and for-profit companies on, on uh, today's presentation. So everybody, you know, our, our goal always is to bring the, the most important topics to the sector. And with website regulations and laws changing, it's hard to know what steps to take to make your website ADA compliant. That's why we have asked Fenton Joseph, lead designer of Olive Brand Digital to join us this month. Welcome Fenton, and thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Kent. It's a pleasure and an honor, I really appreciate it. Hi. Thanks a lot. So anyway, Fenton, why don't you tell, a little bit, tell us a little bit about um, you and what Olive Branch Digital does? Sure thing. So first off, just wanna say thank you to everyone who's taking a time out of their busy schedule on a Wednesday in the middle of the day to come listen to me rant. Hopefully I won't put you to sleep and give you some juicy information about ADA compliance that I know you all wanna hear. So my name is Fenton Joseph. I am the founder, owner, and lead designer of Olive Branch Digital. We provide WordPress web design, development, and care plans to nonprofits and small businesses in Westchester and the surrounding areas. I actually got my start in web design pretty randomly. I was in a band as a kid and we needed a website there was only two of us, Ken, so it kind of fell on me to do it. Uh, I built it, it sucked, but I stuck with it. And over time I got pretty good. So over the next 20 years, I paired my web experience with my corporate experience and I ended up running Olive Branch Digital. So I spent about seven years in the mortgage industry in sales, quality assurance, title, managing client relations. Yeah, so I, I've done brand management, social media strategy, digital project management in the pharmaceutical advertising world. And I still produce music today as well. Um, fun fact, when I went full-time with my web design company, my first client was actually salt and Pepper, the iconic hip hop group. And that kind of set the tone for my business going forward. So that's a little bit about myself and my company. Really, really cool. So what brought you then into the ADA world and why is ADA compliance such a big topic today? That's a really great question. So as a web designer in general, it's something that's been buzzing in our world for quite some time. Uh, when you're in the initiated, you know that web accessibility is a really hot topic because 26% of Americans actually are living with disabilities. And that's a large swath of the, the population that doesn't get to access the internet the way that the other 70, uh, my math isn't too, uh, 74. 74, yeah. Ask the accountant. Oh, oh. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, so um, also because I work with nonprofits on a pretty regular basis, this is something that's really important to them. They tend to serve, uh, you know, people with disabilities a lot of times, people with diseases and things like that. So it's definitely something that's come up on my radar. So why is it important that nonprofits and businesses become ADA compliant? And what exactly does ADA compliance entail? That's a great question. So ADA, for those who don't know, is the Americans with Disabilities Act. And it was created to ensure that people living with disabilities enjoy equal rights in all aspects of life. And specifically, Title III of the ADA prohibits discrimination against people with disabilities in places of public accommodation. Now, we tend to think of these places as like restaurants and office buildings and retail stores and the like. However, in 2018, the Department of Justice made it clear that websites are also considered places of public accommodation and therefore are subject to Title III of the ADA. Now, right now, over 95% of all websites, and there are millions of websites, are not accessible. So there's two things that I want to talk about as to why it's important to make sure that sites are accessible. The main thing I want to actually talk about is the human factor. We're here to talk about lawsuits today and the legal side of it, but again, 26% of the American population, one in four, actually is living with a disability. So it's the right thing to do to make sure that everybody, our brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, uncles, and so forth and so on, can access the internet the way that we do. Now, on the legal side of things, it is obviously expensive and cumbersome and takes a lot of time and resources to address legal matters. But again, the end result is making sure that the website is compliant so that people with disabilities can access it. And that's a good thing. And hopefully that'll make it a little less scary when people think about impending lawsuits. It doesn't 
it's not nice to get called out, but it is nice to make sure that we're doing the right thing. So what exactly, I mean, you said that 95% of all websites at this point are not accessible. What does an organization or a company need to do to make their website accessible? That's a really great question. So there are some basic things that we can do. When we think about accessibility, we think about the fact that some people don't see as well as we do, don't hear as well as we do, may not have the same motor skills that we have. And so that makes their experience with the internet and also with devices, right? Keyboards, mice, I was gonna say mouses, mice um, and other things a little bit challenging for them. So we wanna start to think about if you can't see very well, maybe the font sizes need to be a little bit larger. That's a pretty basic one. Uh, if you have a video and somebody is hearing impaired, making sure that there's captions in the videos so that they're able to see the words that are being said. Uh, really thinking through all the different ways that somebody might have their impairment, uh, you know, make it challenging for them to interact, and then just employing a technological solution to do so. Um, things like image alt tags. An alternative tag basically is going to tell a screen reader what to say when there's a picture on the screen for somebody who's blind or has low vision. So there's a lot of different instances and ways of, of making sure that the site is compliant, but these are some of the use cases that we wanna consider. So when you're talking about making a site compliant, is it something that's always turned on? Is it something that people would turn on when they visit your site because they have um, a disability and they could then say, this is what my disability is, so therefore this is what I need you to do with your website? I mean, how does all that work? That's a really great question. Okay, now we're now we're cooking with gas. So the and I don't want to skip ahead because I know we're going to talk about the WCAG. Now you asked a good question about whether it's always turned on or if it can be switched on. And again, I don't want to skip too far ahead, but there are different solutions that will allow different individuals with different disabilities and experiences to take control of that web experience and maybe turn on high contrast for their vision or turn on uh, font spacing and kerning and things like that. So we wanna give people control of their experience. Um, and at the same time, we wanna also cover the baseline and make sure that you know, most people are able to access the site. So are there software applications that do that? Is that something that needs to be programmed into the website? Are there overlays? I mean, how, how does a organization kind of put those things in motion without it costing an arm and a leg? So there are different means of bringing a website into compliance. And I think actually the first thing we want to discuss is that there are different levels of compliance. So the WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Guideline, which is basically the standard, if you will, that all of this legislation is based around, uh, it's going to outlay different levels of compliance. They're A, triple, uh, double A, and triple A. When we talk about getting sued by somebody for being out of compliance, what the courts are going to do is they want to make sure that we're in compliance with the double A standard. We're, we're not concerned about the triple A and we're definitely, without even really trying, going to already cover the A, but we're looking at the double A standard. When we look at that double A standard, uh, there are plugins and there's also coding that you can do to make sure that your site is built the right way. Uh, I find that most users are going to find it a little cost prohibitive to have a site built from the ground up, uh, you know, in order to be compliant. So there are some really good plugins that we can use that we basically overlay onto the existing website code that will help to bring it into compliance. And one of those, because I'm sure you may have heard of it already, is called Accessibility. Now, before I take a little bit of a deep dive into accessibility, what I'll say is that there are some free plugins, especially if you have a WordPress website, but I find that you get what you pay for. Uh, for instance, I've used a plugin called WP Accessibility, and it tends to rank really high if you do a quick Google search for best website plugin for accessibility. But it tends to cover mainly just things like the font and the contrast and, and a couple other little things. So you do get what you pay for. If you step up to a paid uh, service like Accessibility or User uh, Way or 
equal web, just to name a few, and there are, there are quite a few in this space, they're really offering a more comprehensive and robust set of options and features that allows somebody with disabilities to, again, take control of that experience. They can be a little bit on the expensive side, depending on what your budget is, maybe a couple hundred dollars a year. But certainly when we consider the cost of a full-time web developer in the Northeast is probably making $75,000 or $100,000 a year, it's definitely going to be less than having one of them on staff. And it's certainly less expensive and better publicity than having a lawsuit that forces you to remediate later. So you mentioned, um, I'm sorry to keep going back to this, but that there's a lot of um, websites that are not ADA compliant. How do you know they're not ADA compliant? How does an organization or a company um, kind of get an idea or a feel for how compliant their website is and, and whether they have an issue? Sure. So there are a couple different websites where you can enter your domain name for your website and it'll run an audit for you. It's typically free of charge. And it'll let you know where you stand in relation to the WCAG 2.1 guidelines. One of them is uh, WAVE. It's called the WAVE Web Accessibility Tool. And it's pretty robust and comprehensive. As a matter of fact, I would say that many of the results uh, and the things that need to be fixed are probably gonna be over most people's heads. However, if you kind of stick to a high level, you can see things like the font uh, you know, size and the color contrast and those baseline things and whether, whether or not you're in compliance. And we can certainly provide a list of different uh, website checkers where our listeners can go in and enter their domain name and see if they're in compliance or not. That, that would be great. And then what we can do is if you want to send it over to us, we'll share it when we share the um, video for this. Absolutely. So that would be great. Um, now, you, you've mentioned on several occasions um, legal issues and legal ramifications. I mean, is this just somebody suing you or are there also fines from, you know, from the government if you're not doing this? Who's checking this or is it really just if someone has a complaint, then that's where the problem occurs? There can be fines associated with these uh, lawsuits, yes. And while I don't have any numbers in terms of an average fine, I would say that it's best to get ahead of it and make sure that you're in compliance so that you don't have to worry about these kind of things. Um, I kind of, I don't want to sound, you know, like pie in the sky, but again, we're trying to do the right thing by people. As a business, if 26% of all the people that came to your website weren't able to sign up for your product, buy your product or sign up for your service, that's just bad for business. So by making sure that the site is remediated, you can one, not only avoid lawsuits, but also maybe increase your bottom line. Now, you know, there is a big uh, landmark case that was involved that involved Domino's Pizza. You know, a blind man in Florida argued that he wasn't able to order food from the company's uh, website. And this constituted a form of discrimination. After all, anyone that can go into a, a physical Domino's pizza location and order pizza should be able to do so online as well. It, again, it, it just makes sense to do the right thing. You know, what happened with Domino's is they tried to argue that there wasn't really a cause for the lawsuit to be brought. But you know, the court, unfortunately, didn't agree with them. And they sided with the, the, the person who had disabilities and said, like, no, this is, this is the modern time. The web is a very integral part of our lives and how we access goods and services. And everyone needs to be accommodated. So it's not likely that you're going to be able to argue these lawsuits successfully, especially if companies as big as Domino's have taken these things to higher courts and the precedent has been set. And that's why we recommend trying to get ahead of it now. And, and I will say this also, it doesn't just impact large companies like Domino's, Beyonce also had an issue and so forth and so on, but small mom and pop shops as well can be sued. There's something called section 508, which really just deals with federal uh, organizations and any organizations that receive federal funding uh, that could even include maybe a museum that gets like a federal grant or something like that. But the ADA covers the entire private sector. So even a business like my own 
could potentially be sued by somebody, even though I don't have a physical location, right? I don't have a brick and mortar store. I'm completely remote. doesn't matter. That website is a public accommodation to my clients. When we think about a website, I mean, a website's made up of so many pieces. I mean, you actually have the programming, whether it be WordPress or Dreamweaver or any of the other programs that come to create a website. And then you have all of the underlying document that's kind of sitting there, um, such as videos and everything else. I mean, you, you've got all of this um, material on a website. When we talk about ADA compliance, are we talking about just the website itself? Are we talking about all of the information that's included on the website? And it sounds like it could be monumental here. Monumental is a good word. It is. Um, I it's actually want to. It's the only four syllable word I know. So. <laughs> I want to take this time to give a shout out to uh, Michael Caprera, who we spoke with the other day. He's the chief information officer at the Biscardi Center, and he oversees their digital accessibility initiatives. And they really do an amazing job of filling in the gaps that even advanced tools like an accessibility may have because we talked about things like documents and video and they tend to be excluded from the accessibility conversation. But again, they're actually an integral part of how many people use the internet. How many times do we need to go on a website to download a, a PDF you know, or to, uh, to watch a video or, or, or something like that? I mean, this is all day, every day. And the Viscardi Center in particular has capabilities to make sure that documents are accessible by screen readers, which is one of the key ways that people with uh, you know, different disabilities are able to access the web. Uh, also adding captions to videos. And even they even do audio uh, descriptions, which is like adding a narration to a video. And that is an incredible resource that again, even a tool like Accessibility, which will get you to the level double A, WCAG 2.1, that's a mouthful, compliance, you still have to figure out the rest of that trifecta. You've got the web, you've got the documents, and you've got media. So I would definitely reach out to somebody like that if an accessibility, which is, again is an amazing tool, didn't cover all of your needs when it comes to document remediation and, and video. Awesome. Um, when we look at, and you brought up um, WCAG uh, on several occasions, which is we said before is a web content accessibility guidelines. Um, you wanna talk a little bit about um, WCAG, um, what are they and what are the kind of key principles behind them? Sure, so hmm. the WCAG is probably the lesser known but really important aspect of this whole ADA conversation and you know, we say ADA, we think about the legislation, but the WCAG is not, it's not a law. It's a set of guidelines. It's kind of a, 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 a Bible that's in progress. They're still, you know, figuring out what's going to be canonized and, and, what's, and what's not. And it, it's a dynamic tool that's going to give us all the different scenarios where disabilities can impact somebody's ability to interface with the website. And we're going to try to address those different use cases and scenarios with different technical solutions. So again, it's not law, it's a guideline, but at the same time, most countries that have legislation surrounding WCAG is, well, I'm going to stop saying WCAG, it's just too much, surrounding WCAG, uh, they're using it as the foundation of their legislation. So when you go to court and they say, Ken, well, they would never say this to Sereni, but when they say, hey, whoever, we need you to bring your website into compliance, use WCAG to figure out how to get there. That's your roadmap. So WCAG is not a US-based thing, it's an international thing? It's international, yes, in the sense that it was developed by uh, the World Wide Web Consortium, WW3. Uh, these people really need to find shorter acronyms and names. But yes, it's a consortium of really smart people who are, are trying to create protocols and standards that can be applied across the web so that the internet is, you know, a little bit more homogenous and that we're all able to use it in a similar fashion. And web accessibility was one of the first things that they actually decided to address. And so we have a lot of time. We've got, you know, a lot of years worth of analysis and, you know, um, you know, solution building that we can 
uh, reference. And that's why WCAG is such a, a huge document. I don't recommend that anybody tries to read it over the weekend. Uh, I do think that there are some other educational tools which we can discuss as to how to get those highlights that you need to make the appropriate remediations. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a beast of a document. And it's, it's, I would sum it up as four principles, right? There's four main principles that if you can just remember these, then you'll have a solid framework for forging ahead in the accessibility conversation. Uh, a website needs to be four things. It needs to be perceivable. It needs to be operable. It needs to be understandable and robust. And I think just last night, I realized that that's another acronym. Uh, yes, cool. you need to put, yeah, you need to pour stuff into your website. Yep. <laughs> there you go. So I'll, I'll do a high level overview of each of those four. Um, perceivable. Uh, this refers to the ways that users perceive content online through their senses, sight, sound, touch, right? It includes things like uh, the captions for videos, uh, the text that can be adjusted for contrast and color, and text size and spacing, and fonts, and other things like that that make the content easier to read. So perceive, that makes sense. When something is operable, we're talking about the way that somebody can use the site, right? That's particularly rev relevant to people with uh, motor disabilities, weak muscles. I talked about how my own wrists are a little weak and it can be difficult to type for long periods of time. So I like to have, I like to be on a website that's easily navigated by keyboard where I can just tab through different things. And also some people just get hurt, right? You're playing sports or whatever, you fall down and you know, break your leg, break your wrist. And now you can't use a website just because you have an injury. Well, that's not cool. We should make it so that websites are able to be operable by everybody, regardless of their scenario. Websites also need to be understandable. Uh, understandable sites are easy for everyone to understand quickly. They don't use a lot of technical terms or complex jargon. They, have, they don't have complicated instructions that are difficult to follow. And it, it just makes sense. Now, the WCAG is going to outlay a lot of different, uh, you know, like, exact steps that can be taken to make sure that a site is understandable. But just imagine simplicity. Less is more and let that be your, your guiding light. And then lastly, the robust part. There's two factors to what makes a site robust. Uh, for one, it needs to be compatible with assistive tools for people with disabilities. So again, something like a screen reader, right? We'll talk about that a lot because screen readers are one of the most popular uh, ways that people with disabilities uh, are able to access websites. So your site needs to work with a screen reader. If you have an iPhone, you may notice when you go into Safari in the top left-hand corner of the screen, you'll see uh, a little A and a big A next to each other. And if you tap that, you're gonna get a menu. And that menu will allow you to actually increase and decrease the font size of the text in your Safari browser. I don't know if uh, Android does this or not, but on, on Apple devices, you're able to do that. Excuse me, and it's awesome. It's a great way of making sure that even on a cell phone, we're making uh, websites more robust and allowing them to be, oh, and it also has a screen reader tool. That was actually the reason why I brought it up. It has a screen reader mode where it will actually talk out loud what's on the screen to you. And that brings me to the second part of a robust website, which is that it needs to use you know, clean, HTML and CSS code that meets these recognized standards. Screen readers are going to use the code, the H1 through H6 tags, headers need to be properly in place and tagged. Again, image tags, uh, image alt tags so that the reader comes to a picture of my handsome face and it says image of a handsome man wearing an olive branch digital t-shirt, right? If you have low vision, you can't see me. So your reader has to be able to interpret that on a robust website. I hope that's helpful. It's very helpful. So when you talk about you know, a website being ADA compliant, do I need to put something on my website that says I am ADA compliant? Uh, is there some sort of statement or accessibility statement or something that I need to kind of have on there? Well, what I do know is that some people have taken you know, of, of their own volition, they've decided to add a statement on their site that says, Basically, we're trying to make this site more accessible. If you would like to 
uh, give us feedback as to how we can do that, please send us an email or something like that. However, that's not really gonna cover you. What I would suggest is when you use a tool like Accessibility, it comes with an accessibility statement. And that statement is gonna be automatically generated and displayed within the Accessibility the accessib interface. And it's gonna let the user know that this site meets the, <laughs> the WCAG 2.1 AA guidelines. And there's a lot of other information in there. Um, you know, it can talk about remediations that have been made to the website actually, so that you know, okay, um, this site may have had an issue with tagging prior to installing Accessibility, but now that it's on there, it's been fixed or whatever the remediation may be. And that also gets dynamically updated as your site gets updated because they use AI. Again, I will make a disclaimer, I am an Accessibility partner, but it's really helpful to have any tool, whether it's Accessibility or UserWay or Equal Web, that's gonna allow you to do less work to stay in compliance over a prolonged period of time. Because again, WCAG is dynamic and it will get updated over time. So for smaller organizations and smaller companies that are kind of on this, something like Accessibility would be a good place for them to start? I think it would at the price point, which is a couple hundred dollars a year, if you break that down, you know, on a monthly basis, uh, it becomes actually very affordable. And I, and that, listen, I'm not a salesperson. I always say that when it comes down to, you know, risk, if you look at the investment and then look at what you're able to one avoid in paying in litigation and fines and so forth and so on, or hiring a full-time developer to make sure that your site is up to date, you know, month over month. And then a couple hundred dollars a year, I think it just kind of makes a certain sense. Now, on like on our website, we'll have, and you, you talked about earlier that you know if you know they uh, roll their um, mouse over you and it says handsome man wearing you know uh, yeah. the uh, you know cool shirt that I don't have, um, you know that comes up. But what about if I've got like extemporaneous pictures that are just there for an image on an article? Do I still image tag those or I don't really have to do that? That's a great question. So in general, in web development, whether you're talking about accessibility or not, you wanna make sure that all of your images are tagged appropriately. You wanna make sure that you're you know, following good SEO principles and that tagging and the information hierarchy, <laughs> your H1s through H6s, like these are kind of baseline things. They happen to go hand in hand with accessibility, again, because that hierarchy and page structure is gonna be utilized by screen readers for people who have disabilities. So you find if you're doing the right thing from the jump, you're gonna end up being ahead of the curve. Okay, and now you also were talking about uh, WCAG and you were talking about, you keep talking about 2.1. Um, my understanding is there's a 2.2 version coming out soon? Yes, again, this is a, uh, it's dynamic. It's, it's constantly evolving. There are, is a consortium of very smart people who continue to evolve these standards. That's also, why they haven't reached out. That's why they haven't reached out to me. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're just looking for your email address. Um, again, you know, because it's constantly changing and we live in a world where technology is changing super, super quickly, right? Mm -hmm. Devices that were hot two years ago aren't even in existence anymore. There's some new thing. I mean, for crying out loud, they've got cell phones that bend, like the glass bends, you can fold it up. I mean, it's crazy how fast technology moves. And so we need to constantly evolve these standards because our devices are changing, viewport sizes are changing. When I was, when I was in advertising and, I, and we were doing web development, um, we were looking at, are you frozen? No, I, I can hear you. Your picture's frozen, but we can still hear you. Okay, okay. So when, when I was in web development, we had mobile devices, iPad, and a large desktop. Within about two years of when I started in advertising, we had probably, we had cha they had changed the name from mobile to small, iPad to medium, and desktop to large because there were so many different viewport sizes. When I say viewport size, I mean this, the viewing 
size of the screen on a different device. And when the Galaxy Note uh, tablet came out, it's like it was smaller than an iPad, but bigger than a cell phone. And from there, it just went nuts. And you know, you've got, I have a 27 inch iMac. There are 21 inch iMacs, there's 24 inch screens, there's 30 inch screen. How do you know how to create a responsive, you know, how to, how to you know, build for these different viewports? They have to be responsive. And then we have to consider things like the, the pixel count and the brightness, right? The nits, the number of nits that a screen is able to put out and how that you know, is able to impact people's ability to see based on their vision. It's just madness. And so I'm gonna wrap this up and bring it back to your question about the 2.2 version. It is coming out. We'll be keeping a close eye on when it rolls out and be able to disseminate the useful information to everybody on the line so they can stay in touch with me you know, in Olive Branch Digital and we'll make sure that they get the compliance information they need. Awesome. Um, you also mentioned that there are certain um, guides and resources um, with respect to uh, ADA and, and WCAG. Um, you started kind of touching on that before. Um, what sort of uh, simplified guides and resources so somebody doesn't have to stay up all night and try to read through the WCAG guidelines exist? Sure, so I would say that there's two that I would immediately point to. Um, the more comprehensive and robust and maybe complicated is the IAAP. And that is the uh, International Association of Accessibility Professionals. It's an amazing educational hub. They also provide certifications. So if you wanted to get certified as a web accessibility specialist or an accessible document specialist or the document side of things, you can go to them, go on their website, learn a bunch of information that's you know put together in you know fairly you know easy to read you know PDFs and, and things like that, and then you can get certified, which would you know show your commitment to keeping you know this whole movement going. Uh, the other, and it's probably the simpler one, is again the Accessibility website. Uh, I was pretty blown away by how much great information they have in one place. One of the things that I found as an accessibility advocate is that there's a lot of information, but it's not very well organized. It's just kind of all around the internet and you have to find some slides here, or maybe there's a good video over here. Accessibility has taken the, the nuts and bolts of it all, the meat and potatoes, and said, here's what you need to know. And they put it on their website and it's all free. So even if you don't use the service, you absolutely should go to their website and get a baseline education on accessibility. And that'll give you a good indication, uh, in addition to what we've talked about here today, that'll give you a good indication of what organizations need to do to kind of get started with all of this? 100,000%, Ken, and then even a little bit extra. You can dive into the history of the ADA, of WCAG, Section 508, Title III, and a couple other initiatives that all are kind of weaved together in the ADA compliance conversation. I think it's a really good starting point for anybody who wants to be able to, you know, do a little bit more than just have water cooler fodder. I mean, if your water cooler fodder, fodder includes ADA compliance, that maybe you need to get out more, but it's a great starting point. So then basically uh, from a starting point for nonprofit organizations, it's go to one of these websites, kind of learn more, go run your website through an audit check to see how your website's doing and really you know, gather more information with respect to this whole ADA uh, compliance thing so that they can start moving their website uh, into compliance. That's a great first step. I would go ahead, get the website audited. You can do it on a, a multiple, we can share some links, Accessibility yep, has- That'd be great, yep. Okay, and after your soul has been crushed uh, by how out of compliance you are, because you probably are, then you want to start to get informed about what you need to do. And I think the accessibility site or the IAAP is a great place to start. Now, just, just uh, so I'm clear, it's possible that some of the IAAP stuff might be, uh, you know, gated, you know, might be behind a pay, a pay wall or a membership wall, if you will, because you do have to pay to become a member. Um, but I believe they do have some good free information as well. Got it. So let's switch gears a second here. I know we've been talking and a lot of people here um, you know, are interested in this whole ADA thing, but um, from a website as a whole perspective, um, what principal things have you seen out there 
uh, from a website perspective that uh, both businesses and nonprofits need to work on in addition to this whole ADA compliance stuff? Sure, the number one thing is definitely being responsive. You know, in, I think it was 2019, if I'm not mistaken, when we crossed that threshold, it may have been 2018, that the majority of website traffic internationally went switched from desktop to mobile. Okay, we live here in America. We're very blessed. We've got a lot of toys and technology. It's not the case all around the world. And a lot of people access phones primarily through, I'm sorry, primarily access websites primarily through their cell phones. So because of the fact that web is mostly viewed on mobile, your site needs to be responsive. What happens with a lot of nonprofits, especially because they're so underserved from the di digital side, is that their websites will look decent on desktop, but when you go to a mobile, everything is very scrunched together because you're basically getting the desktop experience in a minimized format. And that won't work, especially with these fat fingers. I need to be able to click on buttons and, and navigate the site. And that requires responsive design. We used to build mobile websites, desktop websites, and tablet websites. There are three different versions. But generally speaking, we don't really do it that way anymore. We design websites to move the different elements around based on the screen. They orient themselves the right way. And then you get an experience that is similar or you know you know not exactly equal to not a one to one but my desk my mobile experience is similar in feel to my desktop experience on um, this is on the olive branch website that i'm speaking about there's a there's a misunderstanding that if your mobile doesn't look exactly like your desktop that something is wrong it's not the case when you think about it a laptop or a desktop has so much more screen real estate you should take advantage of that. You should design a desktop site that allows users to take advantage of all that extra space. And you can do really cool things on a machine that has greater computing power than on your cell phone. So being responsive is the number one thing, first and foremost. Second thing I would say is to use really clear navigation. Your website is your online home. It's your online store. It's your information hub. If somebody came over, you would, you know, maybe leave a note for them that said, you know, I don't know, dinner's in the fridge or, you know, don't go in behind this door in my house. The dog is in there. I don't know. But the point is, you're not there to lead people by the hand and tell them where to go on your website. Your navigation has to do that. One of the biggest mistakes that I see uh, are navigation menu items that will maybe say something like, instead of contact, it'll say something like, let's get coffee or something like that. We want to try to stick with standard generic terms that everybody understands. The World Wide Web Consortium creates protocols, standard. We want everyone to experience the web the same way. When we get a little out of pocket, we make it actually more difficult for people to intuitively say, oh, this is where I should go to get that. I came to this website for this. I know exactly where to go. So it can, especially as a designer, it can kind of take the fun out of designing because you want to do cool things. But again, we want to make sure that people know where they're going and that's good for business. Uh, basic SEO is huge. SEO cannot be overstated. We must follow these principles so that Google will learn to love our websites. We want Google to fall in love with our websites. We want to dress them up, let them be the bell of the ball so that, we, you know, it's, I have, <laughs> I won't tell that story, but let it suffice. To say. <laughs> I'll tell the story. I have a brother who works in nightlife for a really long time when we were younger. And uh, he would always tell me, he said, listen, don't show up to the club, you know, with unattractive people. You know, I, I'm a, I, I work the door, you know, the, the guy who owns the club wants beautiful people in the club. And, you know, that I always thought that was so wrong, but I understood, you know, Google kind of works the same way. Google doesn't want the ugly websites that don't accommodate all users, that don't make it easy for people to find what they're looking for with navigation that don't provide the screen reader synchronization with the H1 tags and the image tags, that don't 
get updated on a regular basis with dynamic content like blogging, right? Uh, we are experts in our fields. If you're on this line, you are a subject matter expert. You know more about what you do than most people do. You should talk about it. You will be rewarded for talking about what you do by Google. Google wants the pretty people. Does, does ADA compliance, going back to ADA a second, by bringing your website in line with ADA compliance, does that help you from an SEO perspective? I would say absolutely, because again, <coughs> information hierarchy, having clean code, the HTML and CSS, uh, that's going to be a huge boom for SEO. Google loves a well-coded, clean website that makes sense and that gives users a good experience. And you know, just for people who are a little, maybe a little confused or unaware, SEO has changed a lot, a lot over the years. When I started out doing SEO, we, we had what was called black hat. Black hat meant that you were stuffing the website with these different keywords like kittens and you know <laughs> things like that, totally irrelevant to your product or service, but these were highly searched keywords on the internet. And so you would do these black hat things to get your rankings up and it was, it was inflated, right? It was fake. But what Google got really good at was determining what's a good experience for the person who's searching for something. If I'm looking for a new iPhone, I don't want to see, I don't want to type in phone and get a result for a, a, a vintage rotary phone, right? Um, I, I want to make sure that what I type in gets me results that I actually am interested in. And Google figured out by using AI and, and, and looking at a ton of data, certain websites were going to yield better experiences for the users. Because when you click on it, I can tell, oh, well, they clicked on it, but they left. Oh, they clicked on it, but they, they went to a deeper sub page. Oh, they found this information and so forth and so on. So Google is all about experience these days. Google is not about keyword stuffing. And what is ADA compliance about? Experience. So there's definitely an inextricable link between the two. If you do the right thing on the ADA side, you're inevitably going to end up seeing the benefits on the SEO and Google side. Cool. Very cool. Um, we're kind of running out of time. Is there anything else that you want to add um, in terms of uh, information that you want to kind of push out to people? I know we're going to be getting information from you that we'll send out with the video and everything, but is there any, any parting gifts you want to leave people with? Uh, I would say the last thing as far as websites and all something that all things websites should have, make sure you're telling your story. You know, just because a website has to conform to different standards doesn't mean that it can't be unique. What I was saying was there, there are kids that have to go to school and wear a uniform and they're still able to make that uniform their own whether they, you know, I don't know, roll a pant leg up or tilt the hat a certain way or what have you. So make sure that you're coloring within the lines, but telling your unique story in your unique way for nonprofits, especially, that's so huge because you're fighting for limited resources. I'm, I'm sure that you have more to offer. Um, I just wanna thank you Fenton for um, being part of this and getting involved and, and really giving everybody a whole lot of good information. Uh, and for everyone else, thanks for coming. Uh, join us next month. Um, next month, we're not going to be doing a Serenity Nonprofit Connection. Um, we're going to have our Let's Imagine, which is the winners of the ninth annual Long Island Imagine Awards. Uh, the event is going to take place in September. And uh, we're going to have a, a great panel um, of uh, really effective and innovative nonprofit organizations. And you'll be able to ask them questions. Uh, also, we're really excited to announce that the applications for the 10th annual Long Island Imagine Awards um, go live on September 9th. Uh, if you want more information about that, you can go to imagineawardsli.com. And the New York City Imagine Awards is going to be taking place on October 19th. So hopefully we'll see you there. So thank you, Fenton. Hopefully we can hear you now if you want to say anything um, as we go. I just want to thank everybody again for taking time out of their busy day. Thank you, Ken and Kelly for, and uh, Christy for putting this together. It's an honor. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take care.